We've looked at a lot of Geekom stuff over the last year or so, and I believe I've already looked at the IT13, but we're going to look at it again because the 2025 edition is out, and they figured out how to bring the price down by a couple hundred bucks. We've got a 20-core Intel i9 under the hood with the, it's got Iris XE graphics, so maybe not for like extreme gaming, but it can still do some pretty decent gaming, and I'll do some tests with that coming up very soon. Are there any corners that are cut? Well, I think the point here is, is that the technology is not like the brand newest, newest thing. It's 13th gen Intel, not the new Ultra stuff that's very confusing. Overall, the performance between those two is almost identical. It just doesn't have a lot of the new AI stuff. You know, if I don't care about that, and if you don't care about that, maybe this is something you should look at. It's also tiny and relatively silent until we start ramping it up, but we'll do all those tests. I use OEM keys for a few different reasons. This is the price you're going to pay for Windows 11 Pro. If you get a retail key, let's check those prices on whokeys.com. $30 and we can do better. But in TS25, click apply. There we go. $23.22. Let's say you want to get a copy of Windows 10 Pro. Also have Windows 10 Pro and right now that key still unlocks Windows 11. You can get Windows 10 Home, Windows 11 Home, and we have two flavors of Office. If you're sick of paying that monthly subscription, well, you can get yourself an offline version of Office 2019 or Office 2016. The other thing is OEM keys are generally locked to your hardware. So if you move it from one motherboard to another, you may need to get another key, but you'll have to get many, many, many keys to equal the price of one retail key. Let's go ahead and check out with our copy of Windows 11 Pro. All right, just put in my card info. There we go. Click on View Keys and Codes. Once you get to the User Center, click on Get the Key. You'll see your key right here in the middle. Go ahead and highlight that, copy that, press Start, and then type Activate. You'll see Activation Settings. Go ahead and click on that. And then right here it says Not Active. Just click on Change Product Key. Paste in our product key, and then click on Activate. Hey, look at that. Active. Head over to whokeys.com. Thanks to them for sponsoring. And now on to our regularly scheduled program. Let's give you the dimensions. It's 117 by 112 by 49.2 millimeters tall. And if you're in America, I think that's about like a mouse and a half by an apple across and a half of a banana down. That's where I live and that's how we measure things. I've worked with Geekom a lot and there's a reason for that because there's a few different brands out there that I would consider premium and Geekom is one that I think makes some of the best of small PCs on the market. Now, for instance, this one, we've got like on the inside a solid aluminum frame. It's like a one piece aluminum frame, which is gonna add rigidity and also be lightweight and but it's all metal on the inside there you know when you compare that to like just a plastic frame that's going to cost three to five times as much so they've spent the extra money there to make sure that there's uh, has that durability on the bottom you've got the nice big rubber feet which are also you know the screws that hold the base plate on the bottom which i kind of like uh, when it comes to the cpu cooling it's not copper clad aluminum or anything like that. They use solid copper heat pipes, so that costs a little bit of extra money as well. And then each, so, and then some other things that they do, like each USB port individually gets its own 150 uh, microfarad capacitor that's made out of tantalum as well. Do we really need this for USB, Geekom? The core controller on this is branded as MPS, which is a monolithic core circuit MOS and the core controller are all branded MPS. Monolithic power systems. <laughs> I knew I, yes, anyway. So they've got the TDP on this set to 35. I think it can go up to 45, but I'll have to I'll have to look it up. The RAM on this is DDR4 3200. It's not DDR5. That's one of the areas where, you know, the price stays down a little bit. So that's not gonna have that much of an effect on the snappiness of the actual system. It's not gonna have an extreme effect when you're doing pro productivity work, 3D design, 4K video editing or whatever, you might notice a few extra FPS difference when you're using DDR5 uh, for gaming and stuff. But overall, I think that's a good way to keep the price down while giving you a lot of RAM. So we've got 32 gigabytes of RAM and that gives you a lot of overhead for multitasking, just having tons of stuff up and running and open at the same time, having multiple applications and multiple tabs. So having a lot of RAM, in my opinion, is the right way to go right here. Comes with 32 gigabytes of memory, but you can upgrade it all the way up to 64 gigabytes. You'll have to remove the two sticks of memory and I do not know what this memory is. I took the, the back off, it's very easy. There's just four little feet back there. You take those off and you can open up the back and then have quick access access to the Kingston M.2 NVMe SSD. Now this is tiny, but there's still a lot of potential when it comes to storage. So you can see we've got our Kingston M.2 right there. It's a Gen 4 by 4 M.2 slot, and you can replace it with something that's up to two terabytes. Just above that, there's a 2242 sized M.2 slot. That's 
SATA interface. And then follow that ribbon cable over to the bottom of the case. And right there you can mount a two and a half inch SATA hard drive. And then this memory, I don't even know uh, what brand this is. I've never seen it before. Shenzhen Wadposit technology. So I'm not familiar with this brand at all. And then let's take a look at the core breakdown right here. You can see we've got six of the performance cores giving us 12 threads right there. And then on top of that, we have eight of the efficiency cores, giving us 20 threads all together. So it's gonna be nice for the background stuff to have like the efficiency cores going. Whenever you need like the performance cores for video editing, gaming, whatever, you've got those right here and they're hyper-threaded. And then for our M.2, you can see we have a Kingston. Here's all the information about it. If you're very curious and wanna look that up, go ahead. Then for the network, we have Intel i226V, great, two, 225 megabits per second, 2.5 gigabits per second, love this thing. And then we also have Wi-Fi 6E, so all that's in there, it's MediaTek branded. For CPU power delivery, they've got really large 330 microfarad capacitors. There's three of those, and then they have 450 microfarad uh, capacitors just for the system power delivery. So, and again, these are all made out of tantalum. You know, the Intel Iris XE may not be the craziest thing in the world for 3D, but it sure can throw some monitors into your eyeballs. So you can do up to four monitors with this, two from the USB 4, those will be uh, 8K. The USB 4 will be like your display port. You can get like a USB 4 to display port. I mean, a USB 4 to HDMI cable will work just fine too if you wanted to go that way, but it's all up to you. On the front, we've got two USB. They're both type A USB 3.2 Gen 2. And then we also have a, a combo headphone microphone port and then our power button right there. Turning it around to the side, we've got our Kensington lock and then some ventilation there. And then let's flip it around to the back and take a look. We got all kinds of fun stuff going on right here. So there's our power uh, cable and we do have a small brick. It's not a huge brick, so that's nice. So we got our USB 4 and then below that's HDMI 2.0. All the HDMI is HDMI 2.0 on this. Then in the middle there, that's Ethernet 2.5 gigabit Ethernet. So we got two more USB ports there. One is USB 3.2 Gen 2 and the other one is USB 2, which is going to be totally fine with me. I like hooking up my peripherals to USB 2. Then we have another USB 4 and another HDMI 2.0. Turning it around to the side yet again, we have an SD card slot and some more ventilation. On the bottom there, you can see we've got our rubber feet and you can use a screwdriver to unscrew those and that'll let you remove the bottom so you can look under the hood and see what's going on. If you wanna look under the top and check on the heat sink or something, well, the top just pops right off. It's really easy. You just grab it with your fingernails or a little device and pop it off. I'm not sure why you need to do that, but you can do that if you want to. Your wireless options are Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth 5.2. All right, let's go ahead and put this through its paces and run some benchmarks. So Door Kickers 2 just came out and I wanted to try that on here because the visuals on part two are quite a bit crazier than the visuals on part one. We've got, you know, MSAA and everything that you can enable, but it runs just fine on this machine. Now, if you want something that's really strategic and kind of feels like Ghost Recon or Rainbow Six, but instead of like playing it in third or first person, you're viewing it from the top down like you're playing Commandos or something and it's real time with pause. So kind of like the Infinity Engine. I'm just throwing you all kinds of references. Hopefully you'll get them all. But you can kind of see what I'm doing on the screen right now. You tell your soldiers where to go, press pause to freeze and unfreeze time, and then you can have them get to doors and breach or kick. That's what the whole thing's about. It's about kicking down doors and going in. It's like you're the SWAT force, kind of like SWAT 3, but you know, top down. So you can tell them as they're moving, you can tell them which way to be looking and which way to be pointing their guns. And you can say like, hey, when you get to this door, you know, you go in the front, this guy goes in the back, but before you go in, throw in a flashbang. You know, you click on the door, use your right click and and have your options to like what you do when you breach. You can throw up like a regular frag grenade, you can throw a flashbang or whatever. You can have them kick the door, you can have them just push the door. Um, there's all kinds of different things. And once you have like your full on task force can be quite a, you know, quite a bit of fun. So I'm playing through just the demo level here, or the tutorial, because I haven't gotten into it yet because I just got it, but I just wanted to see if it works. So if this sounds interesting to you, I had a lot of fun with the first one and I'm hoping the second one's gonna be good. So far it's been, you know, feels like just more of the same, but a little bit, you know, better, hopefully. So check it out, Door Kickers 2. I'll put the link down in the description and thanks to them for sending over a copy of that. It runs just fine on this machine. All right, let's take a look at Superposition running on medium 1080p with a result of 3038, minimum FPS 19.17 and the average of 22.73. So about what was expected for the integrated graphics right there. All right, let's take a look at Valley. Respectable score of 53.1 for this integrated Intel Iris XE. Now it is sharing a bunch of the system memory, but we have two gigabytes of dedicated memory, so not bad. Score of 2223 and the minimum FPS of 24.2, average 53.1.
running on 1080p on the high setting DirectX 11. It was performing so well in other tests, I was like, maybe we can get it to play Cyberpunk on low, but not quite. Almost there, 22.16 on low with the XESS turned to automatic mode. So, not quite, but you can play games on this, including 3D games, just maybe not some intense 3D games. Alright, so I already know this is going to run circles around a Raspberry Pi when it comes to emulation, but I want to go straight to the craziness, and let's try some uh, Yuzu here. This is the, the last early access of Yuzu before it disappeared. We're going to try Mario Kart first, and we'll see how this runs. We've got asynchronous shader loading going on, so when it first starts, it might take a second for the shaders to catch up, but we'll just see. Oh, it's running pretty good. So we're running at 1x, and you see there's a couple of little micro stutters here and there, and that's just because it's building up the shader cache. Once you play the game for a little bit, uh, the, this will go away, and this is running perfectly. Um, you can try to do something like this on a Raspberry Pi, but no, it's not going to work. Even the Raspberry Pi 5, the GPU is just not powerful enough. So yeah, this is great. Actually, amazing performance right here. All right, let's take a look at Geekbench. Single core score 2427, multi-core 10,008. I'll scroll down so you can see the individual test scores right here. Just pause if you need to see anything in particular. OpenCL score is 15006, and again, I'll scroll down so you can see the individual test scores so you can pick out what matters the most to you. All right, let's test out the hard drive and just see how fast it is. It is a Kingston, and I'll also be monitoring the temperature over here. I have to press F5 frequently to refresh this since it doesn't automatically refresh. So far it's peaked out at 53 and we're coming back down now in between these write tests, but I don't expect it to get much higher than 53, but we'll see. Here's our speeds with our one terabyte Kingston M.2. 4,079 on the read and 3,057 on the write. I'd say this is like pretty average performance, you know, uh, maybe a little bit better than most PCI Express Gen 3x4, but not so good compared to PCI Express Gen 4x4 and Gen 5, but I think this will feel plenty snappy. Let's take a look at the IOPS. There we go. And it looks pretty good there with a the random 4K. As far as the temperatures go, it peaked at 54, which is great. The airflow inside must be good enough to keep it nice and low. So the peak of 54, but it only for a second. It's right during the right, during the worst parts of the right. It was at like 53. And most of the time it was around 50, so so we've got some good cooling going on here. So in Cinebench, with all the cores going, we got 11, 8, 32. Now if we look at the single core score and see how it stacks up, uh, it's pretty good as well, 1470. But not insane, but, but yeah. The base power in general is around 45 watts, so they're not running this at full wattage, and that probably makes sense because it's a tiny mini PC, but you're getting a lot of cores. I think that's the main thing is you're getting so many cores. Now I've been watching these temperatures while we're running Cinebench right here. And as you can see, it stays around 77, 78 the entire time when the fans ramp up. Now it was completely quiet for like the first minute and it peaked up, just touched 90 C. And then the fans ramped up, you can hear them. And now it's 77 degrees. So as long as it stays right here, we'll be just fine. Uh, be cool if the fans kicked on maybe a second earlier so we don't peak up to 90, but the TJ Max on this is 100, so 90 is not the end of the world. It's not terrible, but you know, 77 is nice. All right, let's take a look at the fan noise. 46.4, that's only a few decibels above just the natural tone of my room. I do have a closet really close that's got a bunch of NAS units and stuff in it, so that does bring the decibel level up and it makes it a little bit more difficult to hear. You can definitely hear this little unit when it's running at full power, but for the most part, I don't hear it at all unless you're really, really, really pushing the CPU. So I say this is pretty good when it comes to uh, noise levels. When I put it like an inch away from the unit, we're getting this. So only a few decibels higher than it was at my desk when I'm like an inch away. Your ear is not going to be an inch away, just so you know. So there you have it. I don't want to make the video too much longer. So again, it's awesome that we have just a plethora of options when it comes to storage. can't believe they can fit three different drives on this tiny little system. So think about this. If you run a Proxmox or something, put Proxmox on your 2242 SATA, you know, M.2. Then if your VM needs speed, you can install that on the 2280 Gen 4x4 M.2. And if you need storage, install it on the two and a half inch SATA drive. Lots of options here when it comes to storage. It's probably easier to say who this is not for, like it's not for people who want to do like crazy gaming, unless you're okay using a USB 4 dock with a graphics card, which is pretty fast, but that's 
up to you. If you just okay doing like indie gaming, somewhat modern gaming, I mean, played some games pretty well. Just not the big, you know, triple A looking graphic type brand new stuff. So it'll play a lot of other things though. But yeah, I just want to go play MechWarrior now. It's loaded. It's cool. Check it out. The Geekom IT 13 2025 edition. $200 cheaper than it was before. How do they do it? I don't know. All the links are in the description. And I've got some stuff on sale over to EpicPants.com. The mice are half price right now with the coupon code HAPPYMOUSE. I'll see you over there. And Geekom will see you on their website. Yeah, goodbye. Mm -hmm.